Hello, good morning and welcome to Joy News Desk. Coming up, scores of our students packing home as UTAC strike enters fourth week. What's the state of engagement between government and the aggrieved lecturers? We'll find out. And public basic schools still waits in supply of textbooks to enable the commencement of academic work. More as it's been three weeks since school reopened. Also in this bulletin, political science lecturer at the University of Ghana, Professor Ransford Jampo, calls for a total overhaul of the majority leadership in Parliament. Details of this, of this in Joy News' latest hotline documentary dubbed Hang Parliament. If you have Parliament and it's always um, one-sided, uh, one side led by majority and you always have minority and the majority will always have its way, then that parliament is deficient or will be deficient in functioning as a counter-visual authority. We have excerpts ahead of full broadcast at 8.30pm today on the Joy News Channel. These and other stories. My name is Mapisa Sibiri. Stay for details. In our first story this week, Ghanaian universities, for the first time since 1995, are on the brink of shutting down. University teachers say their standards of living continues to worsen and a strike for better pay is now in its fourth week. Statutes of public universities require that schools close down after 21 days of no academic work. In the following reports, my colleague Justice Beidou speaks with some university teachers who have left the classroom in search of what they say is a better job and what that means for tertiary education in the country. <laughs> there are days that every university student looks forward to. Graduation day is one of those. Today's graduation shoot. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited. I mean, Amanda Dankwa has just completed a degree in psychology at the University of Ghana. I'm fulfilled that by the grace of God, I've been able to complete school. In her time here, she remembers several days when teachers stayed out of the classroom on strike, fighting for better conditions of work. Psychologically, you know that um, you're supposed to go to class and interaction with the lecturers sort of helps to grasp some of the concepts but because you have to do it on your own you can't tell whether you are on the right track or not it's it's just hard it's just a struggle yeah. so let's just say i'm a model validation i have come to meet dr suleimana idisa he came to the ghana institute of management and public administration gempa in 2016 to teach and then to the University of Ghana. My take home uh, came to about, I would say less than 5,000 Ghana cities. The incentive to stay here got smaller by the day, the more frustrations I faced within the system. He had just earned his PhD in economics at the University of Missouri in Columbia, USA. Two years after that, he left, went back to the US and took a job as a banker. At the time I was living in um, Legon, I'm taking home less than a thousand dollars a month, which means um, I made a whole lot more money being a graduate student than working in Ghana as a full-time lecturer. I was spending like one third of my income on fuel alone, not to talk about rent and everything else that comes with, you know, the stress of Accra living, right? Um, another friend of mine recently located to another um, institution from Legon. Just on the basis of this kind of rising cost of living and standard income, your money is not going up, but the cost of living is cutting every day, and it's just terrible. The issue of conditions of work for university teachers run deeper. Over the past two years in the University of Ghana alone, around 20 lecturers have left their job for various reasons, key amongst them poor salaries. This is the University of Cape Coast, also one of the country's largest. 
Inside, I have come to meet Dr. Francis Anno. He trained at Cambridge University. Like some of his colleagues, he too has toyed with the idea of leaving the classroom. I remember when I got my promotion in October 2019. When I opened it in the head of the department's office, it was misfeeling. Part, part of it, I, I was excited because, um, well, at least it showed that I had made some progress within the um, three or four years I had been there. But uh, the, the part that made me a bit sad was the fact that I didn't really see any major improvement in my salary. And you ask yourself, you've done all this, taught this number of students, you've had to do research, publish a certain number of papers in certain reputable journals, only to see uh, this. The, director's, uh, salaries. the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission have been the middlemen between government and university teachers. The commission insists lecturers have the best possible pay now. El Ankara speaks for them. It's unfortunate because at the end of the day, it looks as if the focus is on lecturers, when in actual fact those who are really suffering are the students. But it is unfair to them because the employer, being government, is paying you take whatever is due them. Just this October, we concluded negotiations um, for conditions of service. I don't know any group or any person who sits down to negotiate ne uh, conditions of service that will make them worse off. Even the single spine doesn't do that. The single spine frowns on any situation which makes anyone worse off. So it's fair to conclude that by the end of October, we came out with conditions of service that make them better off. Indeed, I can confidently tell you that the conditions of service that we signed off on in October were the best conditions ever for UTAC to date. If we, we can um, pay people monies that reflect their wealth a little bit, incentivize them to work harder, just make them more productive, make them happier. Uh, I think we can solve our problems in this country that way. We can't just give up yet. Uh, we, we, we believe that um, something will be done about our conditions of service so that we can all stay here and contribute towards the, the development of our country because nobody will come to do it to improve the situation for us. We have to work to make things better. I hope that the students will brace themselves for towards the strike action because they don't know when it's going to end and they don't know how many strikes are going to they are going to face in the coming years. So they should just brace themselves and study hard. And by the grace of God, they will finish. One, two, three. <laughs> the strike may be called off, or maybe not, but the issues that underlie the seasonal strikes by university teachers remain and would always come back to haunt the country. Justice Beidou, Joy News, Accra. Join you to show a number of students are leaving campus. This is a result of continuous absence of their lecturers from the classroom. Let's touch base with some of our correspondents for a check on the situation on key public universities. Let's go to Cape Coast. Richard Kodinako joins us on the UCC situation. Richard, how busy or dissolute is UCC campus at the moment? Well, so maps, uh, the campus of the University of Cape Coast is deserted. Um, there's Students are not on campus. A lot of them are in the halls of residence. A lot, a lot also find themselves also in their hostels. But for the first years, uh, they would have wished that they would have had a taste of how lecturing is done because they've been saddled with teaching, teaching. But sadly, they have not been able to do so. And so a lot of them uh, also have gone home. Uh, some that are also on campus are contemplating going home because the lecture theaters are empty. At the moment, what the University of Cape Coast Management has done is to open the university's main library very early so that students that would want to go and have some read would also do that. Uh, the departmental libraries and then the whole libraries have been opened. But on the campuses of the University of Cape Coast, it is deserted. Uh, you, once in a while, you see some of the students passing. You don't know where exactly they are going. 
uh, like um, a flock of sheep without a shepherd. And so they are calling on government to do something about the strike of the university lecturers so that um, academic activities will return to normal at the University of Cape. And uh, Richard, for the ones that are still on campus, uh, any reason why they have not gone home? Well, so they, they are hoping upon hope that uh, something would be done, um, an amicable resolution would be reached between government and the university lecturers so that lectures can begin. But it, it looks as if they are, that their hopes are fading and they will join their colleagues who are gradually also going home. And so they are staying just for some faith purposes or some hope purposes, uh, just in case uh, the university lecturers call off their strike, then they will still be on campus. That, those that would know that they have some projects where they've started working on them, but for some of them, they have not even stepped foot on campus because they've not heard that the university lecturers have called off their strike. All right, so that's my colleague Richard Koja Inyako, and he is at Cape Coast. He's in Cape Coast. Uh, let's go to Kwesi Debra. He's uh, in Kumase and brings us the KNUST scenario. Uh, Kwesi, what's the situation like there? Kwesi Debra, if you can hear me, tell me how the situation uh, is like uh, on the KNUST campus. Kwesi Debra, if you can hear me. Okay, it seems like we have some internet uh, challenges there um, from uh, Kwesi Debra, but we will try and reach him via phone to see that. We also know that one of my colleagues, Manok Kanting, has also been visiting the University of Ghana, Legon, and he'll also give us an update, an Accra update. But so far, we've heard from Richard Kojanyako. Kwesi Debra, if you can hear me, what's the situation like on campus? Yeah, so uh, what, um, the situation on campus is that most of the students have left, especially the first year students, um, because of the inactivity and of course nothing is taking place on campus. And uh, most of, uh, of the students I spoke with said that because um, when, when uh, they, their continuous stay at, uh, in school will mean that they would have to spend a whole lot and they think it's better they go home and spend that money there. So that's why most of them are leaving. And, and of course, I've been speaking with the continuing students also. And though, of course, with the final year, some are having um, their thesis to execute, but they think um, it's better for them to stay at home because staying, um, staying in the school would mean a, a, a whole lot um, in terms of, of course, as I mentioned earlier, spending and, and So um, it's kind of boring. So that's the situation. Um, that's, that's, that's most of the students are leaving. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Kwesi Debra. He's been giving us an update on the KNUST uh, situation on that UTEC strike. Also joining us live is the president of University Students Association of Ghana, USAC, Dr. Christian Philip Amma. Uh, doctor, thank you so much for your time. Uh, now, first share with us your personal experience regarding the impact of UTEC strike on your academic work. Thank you very much for having me and a very good morning to you and your viewers. It's a sad situation because I, ever since school resumed and our parents were forced to pay school fees, get us monies for accommodation. We, we haven't been to the classroom. We are just in school and we do not know when the lectures are coming. And you know, last year, just when we were about to write our exams, our lecturers went on strike again and yeah. the academic calendar was distorted. And the call of the strike actually put a lot of stress on us to complete the academic year because the, the academic calendar was not extended. So mm. more pressure, more work within the shortest possible time. We went home for a very short break. We've come back. Parents were forced to pay fees again. And just when we were about paying our fees, mm. se securing accommodation for ourselves, another strike action. So um, the impact on student academic work has been very, very, very huge. Yeah. And on us as student leaders, 
double wahala because you as a student, you are struggling with your own challenges in mm -hmm. terms of these other things I alluded to earlier. And then the pressure from students across the, the country or the SRC presidents are calling you day in, day out. What is the update? You are in Accra. Mm. What do we tell our people? And just when you are done explaining to them, the students have access to your telephone number. This person is texting you. Some are giving your contact to their parents. They are calling you. Should we go for our awards and take, that, uh, take them back home? Mm. And so it's been a very stressful um, period for the past three weeks. And and we, we, we can't take it any longer. Yeah, so when we're looking at the law, it says universities are, if they are maybe like closed for like 21 days, if there's no activities for 21 days, they risk um, closure. closure and shutdown. What are some of your concerns? Because we're entering the fourth week. What are some of your concerns? So this, this situation has happened before. This is not the first time UTAC has embarked on this prolonged strike action. It happened in the 90s. And some of our lecturers who are currently teaching us were affected. Some of them were students. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they shared the, how they had to spend or overstay one year in school. And so we, we do not want that situation to happen. That is why all over social media, uh, media and also having meetings with the stakeholders from UTAG, Ministry of Education, the National Labor Commission, we are bent on making sure that our lecturers return to the classroom. Mm. If for nothing at all, Ghanaian students have paid fees and we demand to be taught. We have paid fees, academic facility user fee, whatever we have paid and we demand to be taught. And you see the image out there, we have international students as well yeah. who have also paid to be here. Mm -hmm. And the, what image are we sending out there? So is Ghana the destination? where we want international students to always come and have education and benefit from the education we are giving to, to our people. And this strike action, you know, it's very expensive. These international students, the, fee, the fees they pay, it's not easy. They are, they're, they're even in terms of accommodation, they do not pay the same amounts that even the Ghanaian students are paying. Yeah. And they have been here for weeks. This, we are entering the fourth week and no, not, nothing is going on. So. Um, we, we do not want to be quiet about this and we do not want what happened to our lecturers in the 90s to happen to us where we are, we are, universities are going to be shut down. No, 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 we are not going to sit down for, for that to happen again. So you say you're not, you won't be quiet and you won't sit down. So what are you doing? So, you know, the, like, I think that the lecturers hinted that they will be going on strike on a Friday and that it was supposed to start on the Monday. Yeah. So the following week, we, we started the action. Mm. Our first meeting went to the Ministry of Education. Even when they called off the strike last year, we engaged the Ministry of Education on November 3rd that we do not want the situation where the strike action will come back because the lecturers hinted that they were not calling off the strike. They were suspending it. That was in August. Yeah. And so we met with the Ministry of Education on November 3rd and we emphasized the, the, the need for them to work so hard and solve this problem so that when school resumes, we do not have our lecturers um, embarking on the strike action. Mm. And then with the, the very week that UTAC embarked on the strike, we met with the national UTAC executives. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We met with them, we told them that they need to consider students as well because when two elephants fight, UTAC is a big body, government on the other hand is a big fight and yeah. who suffers so when two elephants fight it is the grass that suffers and so we do not want to get into the situation where they have been through before and they do not want us to also go through and then we moved on to the national labor commission when we heard that the national labor commission had declared the strike action as illegal mm. and when there we went to understand the issues and we wanted to let the national labor commission know that you do not have to based on technicalities to solve this issue. Because if you say that it's illegal, we'll go to court, who suffers? The lecturers at the end of the month will receive their salaries. Oh. And it's the student who has paid his fees who is going to suffer. And so it has been engagement upon engagement. And now is the time where we think that maybe our people do not understand dialogue and talking. Mm. Maybe they understand a different language. And if they want us to get there, definitely we will get there. If they don't solve this problem. So when was the last meeting and who was in that meeting? 
and what was said in that meeting? So um, the National Union of Ghana students um, last week met with the Ministry of Education. We met with them. We've also met with them. We've been having a series of engagement with them. Mm -hmm. But I'll say that the last meeting we had was with the National Labor Commission as USAC, University Students Association of Ghana. Our last meeting was with USAC. Yeah. However, we've kept in touch with um, uh, workers at the Ministry of Education, their PRO, who happens to be even a former president of um, USAC, yeah. and also we have en we keep on engaging um, the the national youth tag executives. However, this past week, this just ended week, the the various meetings we've been having are with the SRC presidents mm. because the pressure on them, they keep telling us that they cannot contain the frustration of the students because this frustration keeps growing by day. And you know that we have fresh students, level 100 students who came to school, finished with their registration. They do not even know the university campuses. They do not know where they have to go and where they yeah. don't have to go. No guidance whatsoever. And then there's the strike action. And I'm sure you've heard that a level 100 student at University of Ghana um, has died. Yeah. Because there is no activity going on and students have been left stranded. Schools have not been closed yet. And so you cannot also, as a student leader, tell students that go home. Yeah. And so a level 100 student who doesn't know anything, doesn't know um, the, do's and don'ts. The, don'ts, the do's and don'ts of our campuses, yeah. they are very stranded. You do not, sometimes even there are unscrupulous people who are on campuses duping students um, in one way or the other. And so th th this just ended week. We've had a series of meetings with all the SRC presidents in the country. Mm -hmm. And the, the language is one that if the, um, the strike action does not come to an end, mm -hmm. if it has to even take series of protests on our university campuses, they would lead the students to embark on it All because right. um, enough is enough. Enough is enough. And that is uh, Dr. Christian Philip Amma, who's a president of University Students Association of Ghana. Thank you so much for your time. Welcome. Now, it's been three weeks since basic schools in the public sector have reopened. Serious academic work is, however, yet to start. Textbooks required for teaching and learning are yet to be made available by government. Teachers are concerned about the delays. They fear the academic calendar could adversely be affected. So what's the state of books in terms of printing and distributions to the schools? We'll get some responses from the Education Ministry shortly. But first, joining us live is the President of the Ghana National Association of Teachers on the Development, Dr. Isaac Usu. Good morning and thank you so much for your time. Uh, good morning, my dear. Now, have any of the schools in your region received their textbooks yet? If yes, when? If no, why? Well, uh, thank you for the opportunity, and let me say very good morning to your cherished viewers. Yes, on the issue of the test group for this particular academic year, mm -hmm. you know, the implementation of the new curriculum at the base, at the primary and KG level, which started uh, somewhere 2019. Uh, as I speak with you, we are yet to receive a single test group from the Ghana Education Service. Oh, the mm -hmm. other level, which is the JHS, uh, before school resumed last three weeks, the teachers at the JHS were made to go through some, some sort of orientation for the new curriculum at the JHS level. At the JHS level, after the training, the teachers were given resource pack, which came uh, together with the learner resource pack. And that is the only textbook that uh, are available in a public school as we speak currently. Mm -hmm. And how many schools are we talking about here? Yes, we are, we are looking at uh, in the essence of almost uh, in fact, I'm, I'm not at the office, so I cannot uh, give you the exact... So, so can you give us an estimate? Yes. Almost, uh, I wanted to give you the exact number. Okay, okay. But the, the, the public schools are many in the country. Okay, so what, what kind of books... Okay, let's talk about the books that are to be supplied. What kind of books are we looking at? You see, when, when the new curriculum was introduced at the primary level, uh -huh. in the the information that came together with it was that all the old textbooks 
the head teachers and the teachers are supposed to discard the old textbook. Because the new curriculum is supposed to come with its own textbook. And we couldn't get those books. In mm -hmm. here we are in 2022. We have introduced another curriculum at the JHS. Mm -hmm. the, that one they have been giving uh, learners resources back. But the schools that we have in the country are not only located in our cities. Yeah. If you go to certain uh, regions and you go to certain uh, remote areas, now that basic school has teachers, what they are doing is that they are recommending certain private publishers to the parents to buy books for their work. And if you go to a place like maybe Senate, that you have to cross the river before you can, uh, you can get access to the place, how would the parents even afford that textbook that the head teacher or the teacher is recommending to the parents' work? And so it is, it, it is, a, it is a worrying trend. Mm. It is a worrying trend. So we are, we, we are, we are hope that at least once schools have resumed, the Ghana Education Service will be able to make provision for this uh, textbook because it, is, it has been long over Yeah. Since 2019. Since since 2019, and how is this affecting academic work and schools and the school's calendar? It is seriously affecting our, our students. You see, when the teacher uh, teaches the lesson, the child will need a reference material to do his or her homework, to read ahead of, ahead of the next day's activity. But if the child is not having any reference material, and the teacher comes to class, and the teacher uses it over here, how do you call it, the resource pack to see the child. If the parent is unable to afford any of the individual publishers, segments, it means the child will have no access to any reference material to learn. They don't have any material, uh, learning materials. So how, I just want to figure out how a day is like in the classroom. How do you teach these kids if you don't have the books? For the teachers, they have, they have what you call the resource pack. Okay. So it guides them to deliver their lesson. Okay. But after the delivery of the lesson, the child will have to get that reference material yeah. at his or her own leisure. If the teacher has given the child an assignment, because not all parents uh, have what it takes to buy a laptop and even uh, having this uh, sophisticated gadget to yeah. help their children to learn at home. So the, the textbook is a primary source of reference to that child. All right, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Isaac Osu, and he is the president of the Ghana National Association of Teachers. Now, the Ministry of Local Government and Rural Development is charging metropolitan, municipal, and district chief, chief executives to be abreast with the changing needs of the people and advise government accordingly. He believes timely updates of the people's preferences will enable government factor those needs into its policies and programs. Sector Minister Dan Kwekubosho was speaking at a refresher course for 69 MMDCs from the western, central and eastern regions. Richard Kojanyako has more in this report. It is being held for the MMDCs to clothe them with the requisite capacity in order to manage the offices they find themselves. The country has been zoned into four, and the capacities of the MMDCs in such zones are being built for the task they are handling. Minister for Local Government and Rural Development, Dan Kwekubuche, believes the understanding of the roles and the positions they occupy will bode well for the government and help in the formulation of policies. We want to understand internally generated funds. When they get them, how is it used? We are just a semi-common fund that also comes. How is that money used? There are other interventions from other sectors, uh, even from development partners. These are all things that we're going to understand uh, uh, from them. And uh, we are going to support them to make sure that we we'll build their capacities, give the sources to them to be able to, able to do these things, to get the interaction going on with the people so that we can be well informed. You know, if you're a government and you're not well informed as to the concerns and the aspirations of the people, which can keep changing. What people told me they were interested in in January, by February, uh, by June, they are interested in something else. And it's only your DC who's on the ground who can make central government know 
And these are the changing needs of the people and how to also plan to meet the aspirations of the people you govern. Central Regional Minister Justina Marigodasan warned the MMDCs to keep in touch with the grassroots as they upgrade the government. Therefore, we have no excuse to compromise on judicious and prudent use of the scarce resources as we exercise our stewardship in this honorable vocation. More importantly, we should strive to improve on our relationship with the citizenry, especially our brothers and sisters at the grassroots level. I believe you agree with me that it is one of the surest ways to elicit their support in our quest for nation building. The head of the local government service, Nana Atuata, underscored the need for the exercise across the country as the absence of it would negatively. I want to talk about leadership in the various MMDs. Is the DCs and the district court in directors? The DC as per Act 1990 Constitution is both the administrative executive head of the assembly. The creating director in a head. And for that matter, there's a need for a synergy between these two and also amongst the staff. Today, for instance, we hear a lot of this is their staff are not doing well, this and that. It's incumbent on us to also make sure that the staff are very professional. The three day refresher course will see the MMDC is being taken through managing the assemblies as businesses, promoting functional cities and towns, greening Ghana, and climate change adaptation. Reporting for Joy News, which is Kwejenya Akon, Cape Coast. To other stories now, workers of the Ghana Railway Company Limited, GRCL, are calling on President Nana Kufado to honor his promise of improving the living conditions. The General Secretary of the Railway Workers Union, Godwell Ntama, made the call at the National Executive Council meeting of the union at Esikado in the 2nd Takrade Metropolis in the Western Region. There's more in this report. The General Secretary of the Railway Workers Union, Godwell Ntama said, President Akufuado, responding to concerns on the poor conditions of salaries they receive, which translates low pension, and thereby promised to address the issues of salaries for the workers. But the situation, he says, is worsening. On 19th August 2020, the President of the Republic of Ghana, at this premises, in response to concerns raised on the conditions of railway workers after pension, did indicate that the deplorable very low level of salaries and that we will continue to address it. Come to know that the managing director of the company. Not to talk of the rest of the workers. This is a huge challenge and does not motivate workers to keep up their bed. In view of that, we would humbly appeal through the Honorable Minister, currently through the Chief Director, who is acting for the Minister, to the President, the way of a reminder that the situation has not changed and getting worse. And we plead that the issue is addressed for us. At the meeting, which also deliberated on critical issues concerning the Ghana Railway Company Limited, Godwill and Tama called for the review of the Railway Act, Act 779, which he says has served its purpose after more than a decade. We reiterate our call for a review of the Railway Act, Act 779 which has been in existence for more than 10 years. This act was put in place to regulate the railway sector when plans were in place to revamp the railway sector. And GRCL was not going to exist. Therefore, there was a need for an agency to take care of the assets and liabilities of the GRCL, among others. As we speak, GRCL is still a global concern without ownership of any asset, etc. 
and thus is a great war and the need for the review of the act. The Minister for Railways Development, Peter Amewu, in an address read on his behalf, noted that the construction of the Western Rail Line has progressed significantly. Western Railway Line, where the development of the standard gauge Political science lecturer at the University of Ghana, Professor Ranswa Jampo, is calling for a total overhaul of the majority leadership in Parliament. Professor Jampo, who described the posture of the majority side as hawkish, insists they must be relegated to the backbench, arguing that the pronouncement of the leadership frustrates efforts at building genuine consensus. He said this in a latest Join News Hotline documentary, Ghana's Hung Parliament. A blessing or a curse? Here are some excerpts of that documentary. Since the inception of the Fourth Republic, the governing party had always had an overwhelming majority in Parliament. But MPs were ushered into the eight parliaments with equal numbers and one independent candidate. It's the first time in Ghana's history that the legislature recorded 170 male MPs from both sides and also 20 female MPs from the divide plus an independent MP representing the people of Formina in the Ashanti region. Some Ghanaians were excited about the current composition of parliament, hoping that it would help the legislature to play its oversight responsibilities and sharpen the country's parliamentary democracy. Ransford Jampo is a political science lecturer at the University of Ghana. If you have parliament and it's always um, one-sided, uh, one side led by majority and you always have minority and the majority will always have its way, then that parliament is deficient or will be deficient in functioning as a counter vision authority to the powers of the executive. When we got to 2020 and we held elections, Ghanaians said enough of um, that kind of parliament. They voted to give us a hung parliament. And um, for me, it is unique to the extent that it's not happened before. It is unique to the extent that now the majority group will not have the political strength or the political muscle to flex. Governments, and it's not particularly peculiar to Ghana, governments, ruling governments have agenda that they pursue. They need to drive the agenda with the approval of the legislature as provided in constitutions the world over. And so if you have the numbers and you are in government, it makes your work easy. If you don't have the numbers, then you have the added task of ensuring that the other side of the divide buys into your agenda and travels with you on the journey that you want to go. So the first head of members of the governing NPP had to cross at the start of the 8th parliament was to get the NDC caucus to back down on its quest to nominate a candidate for the speakership. But according to the minority, the NPP caucus failed to reach out on time. The party had already agreed to nominate Aban Babin as their candidate for the election of the Speaker when former Speaker of Parliament, Professor Michael Quay, who at the time was still interested in being the Speaker, reached out. But I told him, bro, you know the difficulty that we have when we try to elect Peter Lajiti. I don't think my party will be willing to go through that path. But if your party can present you, and our party doesn't present a position, because as at that time, my party hadn't taken a decision as to whether we feature a speaker or not. If you can get your party to do this, and then my party doesn't put a candidate, 
on my on my honor. You can count on me. Then he asked, okay, so what does it take to reach out? And I also added, sorry, that since after the election, nobody is reaching out from your end. So my party hasn't yet met. We are meeting today to consider what to do. And I said, oh, so sure. I said, yes. Okay, so what will be my story? I said, well, I don't know my Jesus is the Council of Elders on our side. In my view, if you could talk to uh, Hackman, who is the Council of uh, Chairman of the Council of Elders, to start talking from the top. If some understanding is rich, that, oh, let's allow the MPP to do their speaker thing, then it becomes easy. But obviously, as a whole, I will stand by what my party a minority determined to elect Alban Babin as Speaker of the 8th Parliament began mapping out strategies. The first was to court the support of the independent candidate, Andrew Isiama, of the former constituency. Yeah, and a lot of things happened. What was his reaction? He wanted time to change. And I can tell you one funny thing. I spent more time talking to his wife than himself. As part of my strategy, talking to his wife and telling her what we were ready to offer, if you could come on board and what have you, until a powerful king called him. And then obviously we all respected that king. So, so there were attempts to put him to the side of the NDC? Yes, we did. And I think that we were almost succeeding. Mm -hmm. Then a powerful king called him. And then when he told me, I said, well, this is a king that myself I, I, I revered. So it will not be good to disobey him. But my advice to you is that you know how they treated you. Don't accept anything. If you accept a military position, they'll humiliate you. The full broadcast is at 8.30 p.m. tonight on the Joy News Channel, DSTV Channel 41 and GoTV Channel 144. It's also on our YouTube page. We are Joy News Live also on Facebook, Joy News on TV, so you don't want to miss it. You're still watching Joy News Desk. Up next is business. Hi, good morning. Welcome to Business. My name is Daryl Kwao. Prices of petroleum products are going up significantly beginning tomorrow. This is based on data secured from the bulk oil distribution companies. George Raffae has been following the story for us. Based on the price list of these bulk oil distribution firms for the next two weeks, diesel will witness the highest increase, going up by 5.6% per litre. This should translate in currency terms at around 39 pesos increase per litre. Petrol will go up by 3.6% per litre. That should be around 25 pesos per litre increase. Now, this is the price that the bulk oil distribution firms are going to sell to the oil marketing companies from Tuesday this tomorrow. But looking at the current challenges facing most of the oil firms, of the more than 100 companies in the country, it might be difficult to absorb this increase. However, we shouldn't forget the role of gold in all this. It is currently selling a litre of diesel and petrol at six cities, 85 pesos. Now, if gold, which has its own bulk oil distribution firm, goes ahead to increase prices at the pumps by this margin, then we can say that we should be looking forward to some interesting times ahead. The current development on the international market just seen crude prices is an all-time high. There is currently a convention between the transport ministry and transport operators that any time prices of petroleum products go up by more than 5 to 10% in a quarter, that triggered discussions between the transport ministry and unionized transport operators for fares to go up. So looking at the way things are going now, will the commercial drivers push with discussions for fares to go up? In other news, Milk Home Care Foundation says it will continue to support efforts to save lives through blood donation exercises. The foundation is unhappy as lives are being lost daily over inadequate blood at the various health facilities. Now, uh, Director of Communications for Milk Home Group, Godwin Avenogbo, discloses to Joy Business 
in Tema at a blood donation exercise organized in conjunction with the National Blood Service. Here's more in this report. Malcolm is dedicating 2022 corporate social responsibility initiatives to the company's late chairman, Bhagwan Ramchad Kupchandani, who was an active blood donor for decades. Over the years, Malcolm Care Foundation has supported blood donation exercises aimed at saving lives. This year, the foundation increased venues of the exercise from 22 to 25 across the country, despite some challenges of the National Blood Service. Director of Communications for Malcolm Group, Gordon Avanyagbo is appealing to both nationals and foreigners to donate blood regularly to save lives. This is some, an exercise we've done every year to uh, add to this blood supply in the system or health delivery in the Ghana health delivery system. Uh, it's meant to support the national blood service. In the various hospitals, there are people in need of blood to save their lives. So, Malcolm Care Foundation thinks that every year we can make a contribution. This has just come in good time for, for the blood uh, bank in uh, Takwa and Takwa the nearby areas to have additional pints of blood in order that they can satisfy the needs of these uh, uh, accident victims in Apiati. It's just a coincidence. We didn't plan this because of them but the timing is right. That I need to make that announcement for people in that area. I mean, to make a contribution of a pint of blood to help save lives. Principal Blood Program Officer, Southern Zona Blood Center of the National Blood Service, Stephen Danso, is encouraging voluntary donation to start a blood bank. Malcolm has been with us for the past years, I would say about 10, 10 11 years now. And regularly, they organize um, an annual blood, blood drives like this. And all the blood drives that we organize are always um, successful. And it's a nationwide uh, drive. If there's no blood in the um, hospital fridges, it becomes a very bad situation. And because most of the, even the doctors, if a patient is in need of blood and there's no blood available, they, have the least, uh, they, they can't do much. And that may lead, lead to needless death. So we need to have blood available to help us save our patients who are critically ill and in need of blood. Meanwhile, some donors are urging others to take part in subsequent exercise. You have to also try to help somebody, you know, just to, to bring somebody's life back, to assist other people. You try to help in different ways. So if this is the way I can also save lives, why not? So I'm ready and prepared to donate as long as I, I still live. Before I came, I was afraid, but I think now I'm okay. It's normal. Malcolm will also support award schemes for journalists, Accra City Police Project, and menstrual hygiene education outreach programs of touching the lives of Girls Foundation. And that's it for this segment. The news returns after the break. It's time for sports, and my favorite person of Tao joins me. Actually, uh, uh, let me no you, wait, relax. Yeah. Let me repeat it uh, or oh, uh, say it again. Uh, the Twitter verified oh, come of on. Tao <laughs> joins me for sports. No, 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 no. <laughs> you know why it's thing? Just a couple of days ago, I I was on my way to the office when I met uh, one gentleman who uh, who asked me. Ah, so you and Maps, what are you, what are you doing <laughs> there? Are you sure it's just for the screen? We are doing the Lord's work. You should leave us alone. We are doing the Lord's work. You That's all. So just for the screen, yeah. Um, talking of the, the Black Stars, the president of the FA, the mm -hmm. technical director and executive committee member are currently in Germany. They are trying to convince Otoado for the Black Stars coaching job. But, but, Chris Hilton is in Ghana. Okay. He wants the same job. I see. Um, many would recall that I, on Joy Midday News last week, Monday, we mentioned before Keto Kriku left the shores of the country, he had a three-man meeting. Yeah. 
I don't want to go into too much detail of what was discussed at that meeting. But what I can tell you is that he was advised to engage the German ambassador to speak to Borussia Dortmund mm -hmm. uh, so that they would um, release Otoado to Ghana. At this point, I cannot tell whether the, uh, those conversations have happened. But what I know is that Otoado himself is unsure of getting the job because of the job security. He's, he takes about 60,000 euros. Yeah. Is Ghana willing to pay him 60,000 euros? That's a question we need to answer. We need to ask. But okay. I've always said, if we want to compete against the best, let's be willing to invest uh, yeah, and get yeah. the best in the car brains. All right, so the three uh, possible candidates are Chris Hutton. Chris Hutton, uh -huh. Ibrahim Tanko, Ibrahim Otuado. Tanko. First choice of the Ghana FA is uh, Otuado. Uh -huh. Second choice Ibrahim. is Ibrahim Tanko. Chris Hutton is 100 miles away from getting the Black Stars job. I see. All right, thank you very much. <laughs> but did you, Dramani, and uh -huh. then George Burton have also come into the picture for the role of assistant. But okay, okay. I'm, not, I'm not sure, I'm not sure they'll, they'll, they'll get a job. All right, okay. Thank you very much, uh, Twitter Verified Muftar, for oh. giving us <laughs> that update on sports. And that's how we wrap up Joy News Desk. For more news, you can log on to myjoyonline.com. My name is Mapito Sibidi.